popcorn. Thank you. Popcorn. <laughs> you know, I like that. I like my class to be a little bit different. I know, this is cool. You know, and uh, here, here, Anija, you love popcorn, right? Yeah, I like take, a little take popcorn. Take the whole bowl and pass the it The whole around. bowl? Yeah, there you go. Hey, everybody, there we, we may get to all of you. you toss them into the crowd. Come on and have a seat. <laughs> I'm going to grab these from you. you um, gotta, I'm about to sit on the pillow. You know, I was so, I, I've been reading about Albemarle High School, and uh, I asked Chance what he taught, and he says, leadership, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, creativity, and I thought, what can I do to make this panel just a little different than the others? And it was popcorn. So uh, <laughs> that's where I'm at. Let me, let me start out, I, I normally would start out with Ted, who's gone on this fantastic journey, and we're going to get to him, but Anija, in this, in this question of what, school could be, you're living it. What have you made school be? Well, really, I've just, I know all the years I've been in school, it's been syllabus this, test this, quiz this, study for your quiz this day, and then SOLs at the end of the year. But now with the school within a school, it's been like just creativity for me. It's like normally I'm okay with like projects in class. I'm like, okay, that's the one time I get the chance to be like, I can show what I actually do on my free time. But with this class, it's something completely different. Make it real. What does that mean? Like... What do you do? What have you done? Well, in this class, I rap. I do poetry. I've done... Um, can you do some rap right now? <laughs> I can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. I have mul That's the thing. I have multiple songs, so I have to kind of like quickly think of one. Um, While you're thinking, I want to clarify for the audience, <laughs> yes. when she said SOL in Virginia, that's standards of learning test, oh, right. not what you think. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> Madam Anija. <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to think of like a nice one. It doesn't have to be nice. Not a nice one? I don't know. Okay. We just come out of the White House Correspondence Dinner. I think everything will be okay. <laughs> uh, we, we can come back. But let me come yeah. to Ted for a minute. You, you think about it. Maybe you can rap about this session. But Ted, you went on a, a 50th state journey. And, and you know, as many people have told you in the, in the, in the past, and I, I don't want to repeat those, but we do, we do see quite a number of people who've made it, who are wealthy individuals, wor worried about education in the country. They write books, they come in. And I, I know that you are differentiated in a crowded marketplace of, of do-gooder um, venture capitalists. But would you, would you tell us what you observed when you went on your journey and why are you striking in such a different direction than so many others that have looked at the education system and have seen it not working out right. Yeah, and whenever I talk to educators, I, I, you can see the blood drain out of their face when somebody says, this person has a business background and is now interested in education, <laughs> because that hasn't worked out. And I felt like if I was going to be responsible here, it was important to really immerse myself. And so I took an entire school year, you know, went to all 50 states, visited 200 schools, and just had 1,000 meetings, not really thinking I'd write a book about it, just mm -hmm. thought I'd I'd learn a lot, and I learned so much I felt like I needed to, to convey those stories to a wider readership. So what are the big standouts? Or for those of you who don't know, Ted's, Ted Dennersmith's book, What School Could Be, is here, Insights and Inspiration from Teachers Across America. I'm not really at the insights and inspiration part yet. Um, I'm more in the, in the beginning where you're observing why our school system is just not working out. I mean, what's takeaways? I mean, one is there's amazing stuff going on all over the country in all types of schools. And we often say public schools aren't innovative. Nothing could be further from the truth. And it's happening in places you don't think it would happen. It's not in Massachusetts or Silicon Valley for the most part. It's in central Virginia. It's in North Dakota. It's in, you know, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I was blown away in particular by the teachers I met. You know, it was a trip that should have been tiring and each day, they're so dedicated and they fight so hard for their students that uh, it was moving. And they are remarkably innovative. Not every, but there's a lot of pent-up innovation in our teaching force. And it's maybe the only sector of our world in the United States where non-experts are always telling experts what to do. And one of my messages is we should be trusting teachers to lead the way because, honestly, they make a lot more sense than the people that have called the shots for the last you know, 25 years, the No Child Left Behind era. It's, now, this is very different. I did zoom ahead in the book to the Charlottesville section, and, and the Albemarle High School is, is highlighted as one of the very optimistic notes. Pam, I'd, I'd love to tell you to tell the story of how you came into this school district um, with a big bag and a snake. <laughs> um, 
No, I think it's inside. There's a, there's a, there's a genuine snake in this story. So and, if, yeah. if you look at my hair, you can tell I've been doing this for quite some time. <laughs> and so I'm not going to say how many decades, but I will say that it was when teachers were still using those purple passion sheets that some of you in the audience may remember, mm. and Xerox machines, and uh, there were no computers in my school. But my first day of teaching, I'd had a student teacher, um, I was a student teacher with a, a supervising teacher who said, Pam, if you really want to have a class where kids love science, you have to do something interesting to capture their attention in the very first 30 seconds of the, of the day. Better than popcorn. Better than popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> so I walk into class, and I've been thinking about what I needed to do. So the night before, I thought I was going to be chasing snakes around in the Everglades. I had a real love of herpetology. So I picked up one of my snakes that I kept in my house at the time, tied it up, put it in a, a pillowcase, <coughs> and took it to school. And so I say to the kids, I wanted to do an inquiry lesson, I said to the kids, so what do you think's in the bag? The kids had no idea. They see something moving. I gave them a few minutes to kind of look at it. Nobody could come up with it. So I untied the bag and I started to pull my garter snake out. And the kids made some noise and I said, don't worry, he doesn't bite. By about that moment, in about that moment, one of the kids in the class screamed and my hands were perspiring and I dropped the snake. He landed on my hand and blood started dripping to the floor. <laughs> the whole class was in chaos, <laughs> total chaos. There's a knock on the door and the principal puts his head in when I have kids literally on desk, screaming, boys yelling, I'll kill him for you. <laughs> <laughs> and he watched. I got the class under control, thank goodness. He left. A little while later in the day, this is my first day teaching ever, <laughs> secretary comes and knocks on the door and says, Mr. Blank wants to see you at the end of the day. All I could think is, here I'm a kid who's deep into loans from my, high, my college career, and I'm going to have to call my mother and say I've been fired on the first day on the job. I go to see him at the end of the day, and I sit down with him, and he says to me, what would you do differently the next time? <laughs> and we talk a little bit, and, you know, and he, he has some comments about you know, um, what maybe I might have thought about doing. And I looked at him and I said, I thought you were going to fire me. And he said, if I fired you, how would you learn to teach? And he went on to say, I appreciate you, know, you taking the risk to try this. Let's talk about what tomorrow's gonna be like. And that was my first day of teaching. And I've taken that lesson with me all the way through my career to think about what is it we do that really instead of seeing teachers through a deficit model, how do we look at what the assets are of our kids and our teachers in our schools? Because it changes the game in the way that we think about who we are as educators and about the work we do to serve young people like Anijah. So Thank you. That's my I, story. I, I thought that story was really important because it showed at least a district of someone who's very creative and, and, and Ted in his book highlights this as some of the, you know, one of the kinds of things that, that turns education you know, into a, a great learning experience. So, Chance, I want to jump to you for a minute. What was your snake story? My snake story also involved risk taking. So, yeah. our school about uh, four years ago decided to plant a audio recording studio in the library, which is like, supposed to be a quiet space. <laughs> and, um, and they invited me to come in and work in the studio to, to uh, originally just to manage it. I had been running a, a sort of underground recording studio upstairs in an uh, English book closet, and I was making a lot of the English um, uh, teachers upset with the, with the, the noise <laughs> that was coming out of there. So then they put me in a library. <laughs> and so um, I think, uh, the, you know, very first day, it's like I had this space. There was no real uh, uh, direction on this is what you need to teach or this is how you need to reach kids. So I think I resorted to my, my instinctual um, tool, which is relationship building. And so I, in order to build a relationship, you have to be yourself. And I think that's really been the crux or the, the hinge of my teaching philosophy is identity, purpose, and vision. So identity first, know who you are. I'm a hip-hop artist. I'm a photographer. I'm a gra graphic designer. I'm a people person. So that was my tool for reaching students. And so right off the back, first day, I'm like, I'm just going to make beats. So I'm in the studio making beats. The student walks in. His name is Coleon Trochet. 
And he's just like, this is a place for what? I can like rap here? I'm like, yes. So he rapped, uh, he lays down a rap, we uh, record a song. And from there, it sort of exploded. It's like, this is the fun space in the school. And at that time, it's very loose, unstructured, um, no real expectation on what is this thing going to be. And so I think that puts a lot of the responsibility and, um, and ownership agency in the, uh, in the hands of the teacher and give, gave me really um, the power to uh, sculpt the program according to the identity of the kids who were coming in to participate with me and to really show me who they were. And so that's, that's the identity piece. The next piece would be purpose. So like, what is the purpose of being? Like, why are you here? Why are you a student? What is your purpose of, purpose of your art? And that question can only be answered by the person who is producing the content. And so uh, it sort of took on this whole new identity as a program as this is a space for you to be yourself mm -hmm. and express yourself. And I think that sort of became the driving vehicle for it to become a school within the school because it's a place where you can create creativity and imagination being the, the, the catalyst for that, create an opportunity for yourself to find not only yourself, but to find a purpose for being in the school and to create a vision for how you want to create your own platform to, uh, to project your content into the world. And it's grown in the last four years into an entrepreneurial platform for students to turn their passions into lucrative businesses. And Nigel, what if your teacher, he chances your teacher, mm -hmm. right? What if you were a normal, nerdy, kind of like by the book kind of guy? What would you be doing? Leave him out of class when the bell rings. <laughs> 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 he is the only teacher that I can say has actually gotten me to stay after school if, as long as like, I didn't have anything else to do. Like, there was one day I know, I recall, I stayed after school till like eight. We get out at 3.50. Mm. I did not leave that school till about eight, 8.30 because I was working on music, I was working on wood shop stuff, I was working on so much stuff. So I was just, I, I know for a fact, he's the only teacher that can get me to actually stay after school and be productive with something. So this all sounds to me, Ted, like a little bit like Disneyland. Like, I wanna go back to school too right now and I'll pay a ticket to get in. It's so, it sounds so fascinating, Snakes, uh, uh, rap, um, you know, it, it, it's all about me. When, when, you, when you kind of look around the country and you look at some of the constraints, say you take what's been happening in Oklahoma or uh, 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 Arizona or Kentucky in the protests, part of the discussion about education in the country is how, little re how, how poorly resourced many teachers are. And so what I'd, I'd like to get a sense is that this is remarkable what we're hearing today, uh, and it's very bold, but I'm sort of also looking at the kind of broader question of how we solve the kind of, ec the, the equation of resources, of safe places for the boldness that we're doing. What lessons do you have for kind of achieving this in places that are, 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 are maybe, I mean, I don't know how you're funded, but it sounds like you're funded pretty well if you've got a, you know, recording studio in the library. <laughs> yeah, you know, but you said achievement. I mean, yeah. I, I talk about the achievement gap. The gap that we're really not comfortable talking about in the United States is that we spend the least to educate the kids that need the most help, right. and we mm -hmm. spend the most for the kids that need the least help. Right. That's a very uncomfortable issue for people to take on, but it's very important. And you see some states working to have more balancing across mm -hmm. there, but it's heartbreaking because I write about, you know, a place I went where 12 miles apart, two public schools, one should be condemned, the other has three football fields and a baseball stadium that could be a minor league baseball stadium. So that's a gap. But the achievement part and what I find and what I was impressed with in, in visiting this school district is when you go after the kids' fundamental interest and passions, mm. these kids, in many ways, kids we think of as not being the high performers, the at-risk kids, the kids that are struggling with school, let them work on something they're really passionate about with a teacher that can broaden that interest in music to what I saw there, they, you know, kids interested in music, suddenly it was technology, it was physics, it was math, it was a history of music. And, and these kids, they all have passions, they all have distinctive and different interests that they really wanna pursue. So when you get that engagement right, and when you have the adults supporting a broadening of those interests and developing distinctive proficiencies, that's real magic. And, and it does sound like Disneyland, but honestly, our policies have pushed most of that stuff out of the classroom. You know, we, we talk about SOLs right. when kids are just going through worksheets and the poor schools have way more worksheet content than the rich schools. Mm. And, you know, we get what we deserve with that, right? Which kids are bored, teachers are demoralized and not trusted. And I think that's what we got to get away from. We got to have a, just a complete rethink 
because we've been through just failure after failure with the policies of No Child Left Behind. And what I worry about, I mean, my background is in innovation. You know, I was a top-ranked venture guy. I have a good sense of where the jobs of the future will mm -hmm. be, and they are jobs the student has to create and invent, not the job they apply for. And so when I visited these, their schools, these districts, the teachers that are making these differences, the students that are jumping on it, they're the ones that are going to be able to invent and create great paths forward. And I think that's what we need to Did celebrate. Did you find similar stories as we're hearing on stage in all 50 states? Well, I intentionally write about something from every single state. And the phrase I use there, everywhere and nowhere. Hmm. You know, you'll find these great things. You'll find these amazing teachers, visionary leaders, passion-driven students. The problem is we need to be focused on how we can help all schools. And, and I think one of the failures we have, and particularly people with my type of background, is they think we're going to solve the problem with a handful of chart, new charter schools. I mean, the kids right. are in the schools they're in. We need to help all these schools make progress. You're not high on charter schools. I'm not high or low. I mean, you know, it, it, there's a myth that they're just better or they're more innovative, and some are really great, but a lot of them have turned into test prep factories. And so what I really say is there is a healthy amount of great innovation, irrespective of the, the way the adults are organized in a school. Mm. And you look at what Pam has done in this district, where, going back to the snake story, her early experience was a principal that had her back and trusted her right. and encouraged her to take chances. She has played that forward in the biggest of all ways because you walk around this district, you meet with people, they're supported. They're encouraged to take chances. They're doing these bold things. And so you look at this and say, whoa, what is wrong with this model when the kids can't wait to get to school? They're being launched into great lives with real career skills with no outcompromising college prospects. And where the morale and the motivation of the teachers is sky high. Pam, you're superintendent. You're like the big boss. You tell me you're retiring in a year. Are you worried about your successor? I'm not. And the reason why is because I really think about succession planning a lot in terms of maintaining and sustaining and even advancing the vision. So I've been really fortunate that the deputy superintendent is going to become the superintendent and carry the work forward. And I predict that in four years that our system will be an even more innovative, broad bandwidth of work around cultural work that we're mm -hmm. doing than it is right now. And I mean, I could fill up this room four times, five times, six times over with teachers and kids across Albemarle County who have stories just like Chance and Anija have because we've grown that work in a way that's made it go viral. And it's really amazing. Some of the stories are just remarkable. That we so have. part of why we're here today in this conference doing show and tell and exploring some of these stories is to see whether the, the best of what we have can be copied elsewhere. So do you have copycats in other counties in Virginia? Yes. And in fact, one of the things I talk about a lot inside our own system, because we're 726 square miles, we surround the city of Charlottesville, which is 10 square miles. And you heard from some of my peers today that are from Charlottesville City Schools that we have tiny schools, we have large schools, we have schools in the middle, we have suburban, urban, and rural schools. And my job as a superintendent is to figure out not how I scale up programs that are cookie cutter, hmm. but how do we scale the big ideas of the work we're trying to accomplish? And what my takeaway is Chance and others in our system have had many people come and visit from all over the country, from very different kinds of schools, from Compton, in California to South Carolina rural schools. And what people say is that if you start to redefine the way you think about the work you're trying to do to get to yes mm. when it comes to invention and innovation work, that it frees kids and teachers to be able to try out new ideas mm -hmm. and new ways of approaching the work unlike anything that ever occurred in most of the 20th century. And I, I'm gonna, before I go to the audience and come back to you, 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 you can either um, offer me a little rap snippet or, uh, or both, you can do both. Um, okay. I'm, you know, so much of what we've discussed today is, is the challenge of you know, what, what, people, you know, what people go to college for, do they get credential for, how do they view education, what is education today? And I'm just interested in your perspective because you've made yourself a winner with your, your teacher chance and, and turned this into something. How do you answer that question? Does, credentialing matter to you? Does college matter to you? Do you find, or are, are you finding a different path that you feel confident in? Um, honestly, college matters to me because I've always been a person that's about my grades. Like, I am on it with, when it comes to my grades, there's nothing else besides family that will top my grades. Mm. So, Sounds I, Sounds like a like, rap. 
<laughs> so I do plan on going to school in the fall. So college is a, like the next step for me, but I'm also thinking like, I want to go to school for nursing, but I also know that with this class, I'm able to do music and artwork now. It's not just like I have to just strictly do nursing, that right. I can branch off and do a lot of different things because I didn't even know I knew how to cut wood, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I went into the workshop with, I, I had on heels and a dress. <laughs> And I was like, I don't know how to cut wood. I'm not going to do this. It's going to be all over the place. And I actually cut wood perfectly. Uh -huh. And I burned a scorpion into it. I spray painted it and everything in this one class. And then I had birthday presents for both me and my sister. So, <laughs> I mean, I feel like, one, education is really important for everybody to have. But it's just, you have to follow your own path on it. Mm. Because a lot of people are so stuck on going by the system and going how everybody wants them to go. But me, I'm just finally glad I have a class. Like last year, there was no, like I was in class. We have seven minutes to get to class. Mm. My class was all the way on the other side of school, and I made it to this class within two minutes. <laughs> wow. With the school that has over 2,000 kids in it. So oh. I just feel like if you're passionate about something, that's what you need to strive for. That's what you have to go for. You don't want to do something like a lot of people nowadays, they're stuck with jobs they don't want to do just because they're like, well, I didn't follow my dreams, so I have to do something I don't want to do on a regular basis. But people that are following their dreams like, oh, I want to do artwork, I want to do journalism or something, they're happy while they're doing their jobs. They're not upset like, oh, I got to get up and go to work this morning and I have to work till this time. They're like, oh, I have a new story to write today or, ooh, I have a new idea to paint on a canvas today. So I think it's just important that people follow their dreams more than follow a system. Thank you so much. And I can, all, I can also give you a, l okay. a little bit. Ooh. <laughs> CM18, and it's finally all clear how all your friends surround you then disappear. I had a lot of fears I had to face. Junior year, I wasn't safe, but I had my dreams I had to chase. It's only harder when I don't cry. Tears falling from my pretty brown eyes, stressing out all the time, replaying nice in my mind as if it was yesterday, but I know I'm just a broken record stuck on replay. What happens when I leave here and I'm out of sight when I'm going home at the end of the night when the lights out and the tears fall and the picture in my head is of me up against the wall. Then I see that red alarm and, and, and I wish I could have pulled it, could have pushed it, anything to get through it. Now lights rough, my music loud and the voice inside screams out she's a warrior, a fighter, and a survivor. But how do I know? <laughs> Woo! Woo! What school could be? <laughs> Let me go to the audience. We've got questions, comments, and I've got popcorn here. Great. Yeah. Um, my name is Mia Loudon. Hi, Mia. Um, I have a question for Chance. You mentioned that some of your students have um, entrepreneurship going on. Like maybe, I wasn't sure what you meant by that. Yeah. Is it businesses of their own, or are they just creating a product and selling it somehow? Can you elaborate a little, please? Terrific question. Yeah, so one of the, one of the main uh, purposes of the program and my work is to create entrepreneurial opportunities for these kids because you know it's it's not just about the magic of having a music studio in a in a school or having an art based program you i think there needs to be some practical application so that they can actually provide for themselves in a sustainable way economically after high school if they don't choose to go to college or if they choose to go to college that they have a purpose for going to college to further a specific a specific uh, venture so with my kids the, 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 the music, the art, the creativity, that is just a validation of their personal interest to open <coughs> the doorway so that we can build a real relationship and then have a vehicle that is rooted in, in passion um, that they can follow into entrepreneurship. But here's an example. I had a student, a ninth grader, comes to my room, he's in the audio production class and he doesn't like music. The, his counselor just kind of put him in there and that's the, that's the case with a lot of the kids when they first come to um, our school. They're kind of put in these um, elective courses. So he had no interest in the content that I was mandated by the state to deliver. So how was I supposed to engage him? Now, the, the traditional method would be using discipline and sort of uh, force feeding them the curriculum and basically saying either you pass or you don't. But I don't, I don't have that philosophy that's not in me. So I asked him, what do you like to do? He said, I like to cut hair. He had been cutting hair for like three months. He showed me his Instagram, had like maybe three or four pictures of some hair, of some uh, uh, friends of his who he had cut hair for. So I said, okay, this is wonderful. We're in a multimedia class. We have cameras, we have microphones, we have graphic designers. Let's create a commercial for your hair cutting business. And at that time, it was just uh, an idea, just an imagination. So we went out, now granted, 
we broke a lot of rules. We don't have the license to cut hair in our school. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the Did you have his back? <laughs> <laughs> There's some things you just don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have a space designed to cut hair in our room, but that, in, our, in our school, but that's okay. So I'm like, we set up some cameras, borrowed some lighting equipment from our TV production studio, and he cut my hair. I had about three inches of hair. He cut my hair, gave me a nice fade, line up. We um, had some other students who were like also in the same boat. I don't really know what I want to do. Well, do you like taking pictures? Yes. Take some pictures of this. Be our photographer. So we start by sort of assigning them these professional roles that are tied to their personal interests. They don't see that it's, a, that it's a business yet. They don't see that it's an opportunity to make money in the future. They're just having fun. He posted this video on YouTube, and, uh, and within one week, we had 10 Elmore High School students line up outside my classroom door to get haircuts during lunch from, <laughs> from the barber. He changed his, 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 his uh, business name was Jason Blends Barbers. <laughs> and so I would have him come in my room and cut hair every day. With, uh, that was last year. This year, he is uh, making a probably close to 200 bucks a week cutting hair <laughs> as a sophomore. <laughs> he's, he's, because, because the validation of his passion he now has the self-motivation and the intrinsic motivation to then pursue the licensure pathway for, for cosmetics at our tech school in the county. If that, if that, if that language or that uh, passion is not validated, that motivation doesn't exist. He doesn't go that route. And so um, he now is he's in the cosmetic uh, class. He's making about 800 bucks a month. Right. His parents support him so much that they've get, given him their living room as the <laughs> barber shop. I, over spring break, got my hair cut again, and I was just like, you've really upgraded. You've been promoted. He has his mirrors, lights, his own barbering in his house, and that's like one of... Margaret Lowe wants me to go get my hair cut. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do that. Yes, um, right here in the middle. Hi, this is Sabrina Epps, um, graduate student at Fielding Graduate University. Um, I've Kind of to your point about breaking the rules and then to the superintendent and also Ted, um, how, looking forward, how do we start to break down those barriers so that systemically um, school systems can support that type of innovation and, um, and also to extend those types of ideas to support those big ideas from school district to school district so that we can really, because we're, we're not running out of time, but time right. is passing more quickly than it ever has. Right, so let me start with Pam and then, and then finish with Ted. Pam? had a philosophy. I don't know, is this thing actually yeah, working? There, go, yeah. there it yeah. is working. <laughs> it is on. But I've had a philosophy for a very long time uh, since I had a mentor say to me, Pam, when I was describing a teacher who I thought had a really crazy idea, and I was an early young administrator, mm -hmm. he said, if you tell this teacher no, this teacher's going to go out, and not only is she not going to ever come back to your office with another idea, She's going to tell 10 other teachers what you said, and they're never going to come to your office either. So that getting to yes mode is absolutely critical for me when people come with ideas. And some of those ideas do tend to challenge the boundaries on the river that we have set up in public schools. Mm. But if we can get to yes, engage teams around an idea, leverage resources, and Admiral, by the way, is a national average per pupil school division, and then be able to <coughs> prototype up the kind of work. Chance's work started with Chance, but it has spread across our high schools and our middle schools, all now have studios where kids are doing similar work. We've had people from outside the system adopt these right. ideas and take them in. But for me, it is Yelp. Get to yes, engage a team, leverage resources, and prototype so that you can get it right, and then let the ideas spread. Yelp, that's a new one for me. Yeah. Great. It's kind and of I do two seconds on breaking the rules? <laughs> I like the fact that my teacher breaks the rules because without that, I wouldn't have my son. Like, I do fashion and a lot of other stuff. So without that, I wouldn't be doing fashion. I wouldn't be doing hair. I wouldn't be rapping. I wouldn't be, be doing poetry. So breaking the rules, is it's a good thing occasionally. Qu quick, quick intervention, Chance. I think it's absolutely necessary to break the rules because one of the biggest rules that needs to be broken is c the monoculture that sets the standard for what learning is and how you should learn. And I think that's some of the, 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 the main purpose of the work is to create cultural equity where if you're a student in my room, what is your way of learning? What is your way of, of, of being motivated to come to school? I want to support 
that diversity. And so I think that's sort of the foundation from which the classroom diversity and the uh, even racial diversity that we're all kind of talking about can bir be birthed from is having a diversity of thought, a diversity of uh, philosophy in your room. And so I think the rules definitely have to be broken. Um, and I also think it produces multi-dimensional artists, which I think enhances your skill set, your ability to visualize a, um, a success in your life, your ability to create opportunities, and this very creative mentality is, is, is what we're trying to foster through breaking some of the rules. And Ted, as we finish up with you in answering her question, and, and just knowing the scale of what you've committed yourself to do and looking at all of these pockets of uh, educational innovation. You know, I know that you don't actually like prescribing something across all this, and that's ant antithetical to your message, but what are the most important messages you want people to walk away from that might answer her question? Well, I mean, I'd start with, and, and a great way to end this whole terrific summit that your um, organization put together is, somebody sent me a note a couple weeks ago, and they said, I have the feeling the dam is about to break. I think there's an enormous amount of energy around letting kids run with their passions and develop distinctive hireable proficiencies and restoring trust to the teachers in our workforce and letting them do what they enter the profession to do, which is to engage and inspire their students. And so as that starts to happen, and I write about the great transformation that happened in 2009 to 16 in New Hampshire. I'm in Pittsburgh tomorrow with this really remarkable community-wide celebration of remaking learning. I think people are starting to realize that Take Jason, if you just ground Jason through a regular process and he dropped out or graduated with nothing very special, that's a kid in for a world of hurt in his adult life. He's found a way forward that he's excited about. And so these differences aren't 0.3% swings on NAEP scores. These are great lives versus lives that just went wrong. And so I think that's what all of us as adults have a responsibility to do is to support the amazing educators like Pam, like Chance, so that students like Anijah can just find their lane and run forward and make the world better because we've left them with some problems to solve and they're going to solve them for us. Well, with that, I want to thank Pamela Moran, superintendent, Chance Dickerson, teacher, uh, Anijah Johnson, student of the Albemarle High, School, uh, High Schools, and Ted Dintersmith, thank you so much for provoking us with your book, What School Could Be. Thank you all so much.